Hello, everyone, and welcome to Integrated Rhythm, two swing dancing besties. That's Chisomo Salamani and myself, Bobby White, navigating race and the black experience in swing dancing and other Afrocentric social dances. This is a junk drawer episode. And if you don't have a junk drawer in your house or didn't have one growing up, then we might need to explain what that means. It means it's where we put a bunch of stuff that was small and didn't necessarily fit somewhere else. Uh, so we're going to talk about a few different topics. By the way, I should also mention that we recorded this episode on a Friday night after a very long week, and we did not realize how affected we were going to be by said long week. So if you uh, are a... If you are the kind of person who likes to listen to your podcast faster, you're already there. Don't worry about it. Um, if you have not listened to your podcast at a higher than normal tempo and this conversation starts to be slow, uh, before you hop off the conversation, we recommend just bumping up your speed just a little bit and that should get you the words flowing a little bit faster than they were flowing for us. All right. So first up, when we ask guests on this podcast, we usually start with an I am asking if they're up for taking part. We asked one elder, a pioneer of the dance in the late 70s up through today, and they sent us a response we want to chat about for just a bit. This elder very respectfully declined, and they mentioned they didn't think they could help with the hard discussions our modern scene is tackling. They mentioned a few reasons why, but we thought the response a good thing to discuss. Yeah, and I, I actually am going to frame it uh, just a tad differently. Um, I think that um, while um, the position of the person is important in the dance, more so it's about engagement. So what this what this interaction made me think about was like what it means to be a person from a marginalized perspective or an underrepresented perspective in the United States um, or actually anywhere. And um, having the opportunity to speak from your perspective, but then also um, it's an opportunity in representation. Because when you, when when we're talking about underrepresented populations, um, when there's a platform provided, there's this moment for more people to hear about that about that perspective or to be informed a little bit more. And so the feeling that I got was essentially that um, this individual didn't want to participate, didn't want to um, represent or deal with the burden of education or burden of fixing um, some of our societal or community issues. And I think that that is 100% okay. Um, yeah, oftentimes, absolutely. yeah. So if you look at different civil rights movements, um, even looking, going back a hundred years, thinking about the women's march and, um, stuff, uh, women's suffragette movement, um, and then thinking a little bit about the civil rights movement in the sixties, uh, black women were a pivotal part of these different civil rights movements. And, um, and they kind of bear the brunt of a lot of the societal issues that we experience. Um, and there, there was this expectation that, um, that we would go along with whatever society had for us without having the opportunity to speak. So oftentimes myself as a black woman, I will be excited to speak because then that's an opportunity that I realize that maybe my grandmother didn't have, or it might be something that somebody else didn't have, but there is this burden placed um, on those who step into the light to um, educate. And so we need to ask ourselves when we're leaning on somebody to help, like, are we doing our part in figuring out how to move forward? Or are we expecting whomever we're asking to solve the thing for us? And oftentimes we lean on, and I, I'm going to say this in swing dance, I'm going to say this in majority spaces, we lean on underrepresented parties to make the world a better place. And so 
I have said before in classes and to friends, like the burden of the disenfranchised is on the disenfranchised. And that's not fair. Um, I think it also might feel a little bit counterintuitive if, if somebody says no to an opportunity. Um, we might think like, oh, well, why would they say no? Um, but there is there is a burden there. There's an emotional labor that's expected from someone to dig into their own trauma and try to build bridges to make a brighter and better future. And so um, uh, one of my colleagues and I wrote an article, her name is Dr. Anna Young, and we were essentially giving advice to academics about how to have a more equitable space within classrooms, how to be anti-racist faculty. And one of the notions that we posed for people, one of the things we asked people to think about was tokenism versus representation. And so when are we choosing a token? When are we asking a person to make us feel better by being from a different perspective. And so we might feel enlightened listening to that person. And so we want to like raise them up as an example, um, but are they choosing to be that example um, versus representation, allowing people to engage in the way that they want to. Like ultimately what we want is more equitable access to this thing. We want everyone to have the opportunity to interact with dancing in a way that makes sense to them. And so, um, Bobby, another discussion you and I had um, about uh, was about uh, prominent dancers and the expectation that happens sometimes when um, you have these incredible dancers out there in the world um, and this notion of exceptionalism. And so some people might come into the scene and feel like they have to rise to the level of this exceptional person um, rather than recognizing that they can step into this into this dance scene and just be themselves. And they don't have to like win all these awards or be this um, oh, amazing award-winning artist. They can just exist as they are um, and grow into a greater realization of, who, of what that means. So those were some thoughts that I had um, related to this specific instance. Um, Cause I think, and I, like I said, I think it's about recognizing how people um, can engage and allowing people to engage to the degree that they would like to. What are your thoughts, Bobby? <laughs> I had vague thoughts that were not as clearly defined and well said as yours. And so uh, <laughs> no need for me to say, say much of anything. Um, so if you want to hear a white guy say everything to someone just said, then, but not as well. <laughs> so I have two thoughts. And so one of them, and I'm going to try really hard to hang on to both of them. Um, one of them had to do with your response, like how I perceived your response. And then the other one had to do with participation. So the way that I perceived your response to the situation was you immediately were like, oh, you don't want to participate? Totally cool. Cool, cool. Let's, you know, um, I want to, I want to honor you and your no. And, um, and so I appreciated that you, like, there in no way was there any offense taken. In no way was there any um, thought of like, grumbling or like you should do this you had this this immediate respectful like absolutely i want to make you as comfortable as possible and and i know that that's part of your framework in the way that you exist bobby is that you um work to cultivate safe spaces and spaces that don't have shame and and so i saw that being your split second response and then um and so I, I think one, that's beautiful. And then two, uh, in terms of participation, I think sometimes when people say no, um, when we ask for something anytime in our, anytime, um, if we, if someone says no, we take that as a rejection. So you, I, I immediately, because I always have like, <laughs> because my uh, romantic life is one that is uh, to be desired. It is 
is incredible. No, I'm, I'm, I'm actually being very sarcastic. Um, I always <laughs> think about um, whenever you ask for something that there's this immediate like thought of like, if someone says no, then you're being rejected. But that's not, that's actually not what's happening. When someone is saying no, they're drawing a boundary for themselves and it's great to celebrate that boundary. Um, but then it's also okay to, to leave the door open for them to engage to the level that they want to engage. So I feel like sometimes when people, um, like we, we see this question of like, oh, um, I hear different people saying like young black people don't want to be involved with Lindy Hop or like, um, we can't get certain populations through the door. Um, I would say keep asking, keep cultivating your spaces to be safer and then keep asking. Don't just take this like no as a no in perpetuity always. Take it and be respectful, but then also be adaptable and allow people to, if they come back later on and say, hey, I would love to engage in this way, allow them to do so. Because I feel like sometimes, like even with like teaching gigs, people might be like, we can't ever get teachers of color. They always say no to us or um, they say no to us and they've said no to you one time. Um, I think that we need to have a type of flexible thinking that allows people to continually inform us and draw their lines of consent without us super imposing lines. So um, we need to be careful about the feelings of rejection that we might have. Um, and, and Yes, and, absolutely. Yeah. No, I totally, I totally agree with that sentiment that, um, I totally agree with that sentiment. <laughs> <laughs> Worst podcast partner ever. <laughs> no, not at all. Best podcast partner ever. It's just. <laughs> Podcasting ain't free. Podcasting ain't free. You may think it costs no money, but podcasting ain't free. We. I've been curious about your thoughts in terms of leader privilege, um, and uh, I because I've even seen you. So this is like not this is beyond the race paradigm. This has more to do with like leader follower privilege. And I've seen you in your teaching pairs like intentionally step back and let your co-instructor facilitate or whatever. And then you, you do your, but it's just like in such a supportive way versus like um, what I feel like is common in classrooms where um, leaders are like, I respect my followers voice and I'm going to talk all over my followers. voice." <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, so, uh, yeah, so part of that is uh, I have a lot to thank for Kate Hadeen, um, who's my longest standing uh, partner, teacher, yeah. co-teacher, co, co co-partner, um, is uh, I, uh, when we were first working together, I was like in my young 20s, and I was very much a... Uh, I liked making jokes and I liked being the center of attention in small ways, like classroom ways and that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I also having ADD, if I'm not taking part in the conversation a great deal, then, um, then it's, I lose track of it. Like uh, my brain shuts off or it, it won't let me pay attention to what's going on. And so in a way it's also kind of a strange coping mechanism to like keep myself engaged in a conversation is to be, uh, was at that time to be like jumping in often in the conversation. And, uh, and it was really hurtful for her that I would basically jump on the end of all, of, a lot of her sentences, like she wouldn't even finish a sentence before I was jumping in and adding to the thing, having not given the respect of the thoughts completion that she had, you know, that she was going for. And so um, I owe a lot of credit to her calling me out on that and calling me out on it again and again and again, even though it was really frustrating for, her. but she, 
she didn't let it slide. She just like kept calling me on it. And uh, I started to realize how obviously I was doing it and, and how that was really not cool at all. And so, um, and so it got me really thinking about that, that personality trait of mine and how to correct for it. And so, um, yeah, so that a, a big, a big, a lot of thanks goes to her for like, kind of like putting a mirror up to that aspect of, of me, which I'd had all my life and no one had put that mirror up to me as clearly and as obviously and as stubbornly as, as she knew she had to in order to get that behavior to change. A lot of leaders go through this change in their dancing lives. And for some leaders, it doesn't, happen at all unfortunately for some leaders it can happen really quickly especially now in the modern scene which is a little bit more keen uh, and aware of this situation and corrects for it hopefully pretty early i, I would assume um i certainly try to in my classes uh but a lot of leaders go through a journey where the the journey the beginning of the journey is i have to lead everything and know what's going on all the time because that's my job as a leader and then their journey changes and they realize that their job is to is to lead only a little bit and then follow the rest of that lead follow whatever the follower is doing follow whatever information is coming in from your partner from the music from your own body like so you a leader only really starts a lead and then they spend the rest of the time listening and following the lead that they've started or initiated. And then it becomes this, you know, like uh, chicken and the egg situation where all these influences are going into the movement of both partners that leading is becomes a vastly oversimplified way of looking and defining that, that role. Uh, just like following becomes a vastly, vastly oversimplified way of defining that role. Um, and so uh, a similar thing happens in or happened for me in the classroom is that there was a there was a time when I was like, oh, I need to have a plan. If, if, if I'm in charge of having the class planned then I need to have the whole class planned. And that's my job as the, the leader of this class. Uh, and then there was a change that came where my job is. It's much better and it's much more fun for everybody involved. And it's much more fruitful if I if I initiate an idea with my partner and then we just follow that idea. And so that we we start trading things back and forth. And if my my partner has something to say, then I'm now the student. And so I now try to listen the same way that I hope the students are listening. Um, and another person I want to give a, a shout out to is uh, David Ream, in Balboa instructor, Lindy instructor, who um, he, I noticed uh, when I was up and coming or when I was like being a student and then first started teaching, I noticed that his, the way that he moved around in the classroom was really, really specific and different than other teachers that I knew. And so I talked to him about it and and he he basically tries to think about every aspect of his class, especially in terms of his body language and what his body language and where it is in the classroom affects the, the learning process. And so I kind of took that basic concept and applied it to my own personality and to the way that I like to do things. And so um, I very literally will move if my partner is saying something i'll often very literally move to close really close to the student circle and i'll because i'm a six foot two tall guy i'll also kneel or get down a little bit so that i basically take all attention away from me and focus it on on the person teaching at that moment and so that's also kind of like you, when you mentioned i literally you know i think you said like i literally give space to the my partner or whatever that was what popped in my head is that oh yeah i i literally try to step back and become very close to the students when that happens i i think that that is so cool as you're talking about um 
your choices in teaching, it made me think of like um, Perry student development model. And um, essentially, there are these different phases of being a student. Um, uh, Perry was a professor at Harvard that came up with a student development theory, and he posited these different phases. And um, a more advanced phase has to do with recognizing that um, a teacher has something to say, but so do the students, versus like um, many people who are beginners at something kind of have this default expectation that the instructors know all and they know nothing. And so um, I love that you foster that idea by, like you said, initiating this concept and then having the focal point be the concept that you and your um, teaching partner are dealing with, but then also the students are involved with that. So there's this notion of co-creation. Um, and so when I think about like equity and making the world a better place, I often think about co-creation and collaboration. And so all the things that you talked about have to do with understanding who you are, what you're bringing into the dynamic, and then adjusting either adjusting your positionality. So you were physically adjusting your position by like stepping away or kneeling to indicate to people like you also have space here and you get to engage in this. And um, you're like dismantling this hierarchy by like literally bringing yourself down. Um, and so I, I just see so many ways uh, in which you choose to live your life that um, I think uh, in, encourage a more equitable existence. And so that's one of the reasons why I love talking through these topics with you and working with you. So you, you look like you've got some thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, like, so the second that you said that about equity, uh, I absolutely agree. And, you know, I was just, I was just watching um, this clip on the Amber Ruffin show. So if you don't know Amber Ruffin, she's this fantastic comedian and writer who writes for Seth Meyers usually, but she now has her own show, which is also really exciting. You can go check out her clips on YouTube, Amber Ruffin. And she was talking about um, I'm going to mess it up now that I'm on the spot. Uh, zero sum ec uh, economics, zero sum, zero sum game is the term I was looking for. Basically, uh, you know, the idea that there's only one chunk of the pie. And if, and if, and if someone has, if someone new gets a piece of the pie, then they've taken a part of your pie because there's only X, there's only a limited amount of pie. Right. Yeah, that that line of thinking. Right. And that to me is very much the 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 former concept I was talking about, where like I as the leader have to come up with all of the material for the class. Yeah. And, you know, and, and so I'm in charge of all the material for the class. I am the leader have to come up with all of the moves for this dance that we're about to have. And that that is an exhausting idea. Um and the same as a teacher, like I am the person responsible for saying everything that is important in this class is an exhausting. Um, uh, yes, it can be empowering in a, in a way, in a, in a sense that like once you have spoken for an hour and are pretty sure that everything you've said is, you know, a, a good, a good instruction to give. Yeah, you can pat yourself on the back for having like done that legitimately difficult task as legitimately difficult task. I'm not going to knock the difficulty of that task, but, uh, as soon as you and your partner are working together, as soon as you get your students involved, you're now more of a curator than a, than the sole source of information. And you're more of a guide rather than the end all be all of knowledge. And, uh, and, and in the same way of the equity space, like, so imagine a person who's like a promoter in the scene, maybe thinking about it more in the terms of the former person who's like, I, as the promoter, have to come up with all the ideas. I have to do all the work. And I had like this event, this event is 100 percent my event. Right. Um, as opposed to thinking of the more of the the 
latter choice where I, as the promoter, am a guide and an instigator. Like what ideas can I work with? Who can I get involved? Who wants to help carry this and help guide this into a new space? You know, who, you know, how can we, how can we make the best thing together out of all the resources that we have at hand? I, another thing that I, I love in relationship to that is um, thinking about how diversity is actually more efficient and effective. Um, and because uh, act oppression and marginalization is actually inefficient because then you are depending on a smaller percentage of people to do a thing. Like if we include everybody, if we create greater access and greater equity, that's opening up all kinds of possibilities, you know, like more, more different, we have different perspectives, different ways to solve problems, different ways to collaborate. Um, it is actually better for us as a society. Um, and so, so yeah, it's, it's actually the opposite than of, of what we, of our natural inclination. So anyway, I thank you so much for sharing, Bobby. I just, I think that you have, um, a wealth of knowledge and experiences. And I really have uh, appreciated watching you operate in the world. Um, and so, and I've been thinking a lot about like um, how you tick. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so thank you for sharing. You heard enough and now it's time for the break. All right, let's say that you have someone in your life that loves comics, or possibly you are the person in your life that loves comics. Well, there is a great gift to either give to that loved one who loves comics or to give to yourself a loved one who also loves comics, and that is Noir is the New Black. It is 16 original comic book stories based on black American noir storytelling. You heard me right. It's dark, it's gritty, it's amazing artwork and fantastic storytelling and for all you uh swing dancing buffs out there a lot of the stories are set in the jazz era so that's something really cool about it as well it began as a kickstarter that's where i hopped on and i just got my copy and i love it so check out noir is the new black you can go on to google type in noir is the new black it'll probably take you to the kickstarter page where you can purchase it and enjoy Hey everybody, this is Bobby White from Integrated Rhythm. We're here to ask you to please consider donating to the podcast. You can do so by going to patreon.com slash integrated rhythm. You can do so by Venmoing at Bobby Swungover. And make sure to put a little IR in the note so we make sure it goes to the right people. You can also do so by PayPaling at Bobby White 3. And once again, putting a little IR in the in the window there. Doing so will help us keep this podcast going, and we love doing it, and we hope you love it too. If you can't afford to donate at this time because times are rough, we totally understand. We don't want you to put yourselves out. We want you to keep enjoying the podcast for free. However, if you have a little bit of pocket change in your pocket, we would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it. Thanks, and have a great day. Now break is over. Now it's back to the show. All right, so uh, let's let's end by talking about um, a great way to apologize. This this popped up uh, due to some things that were going on in the scene uh, in early in 2021, and Odysseus Baylor, uh, New Yorker and uh, blues and Lindy Hop dancer, instructor, DJ, lecturer. He had um, some wonderful advice on apologizing and the art of apologizing, especially if you're a non-person of color apologizing for something that has affected people of color or their perception in the scene. So I'm going to start, I'll just start reading it. Uh, so this is again by Odysseus Baylor. Hello, everyone. My name is Odysseus Baylor. Uh, I'm an NYC-based blues and Lindy Hop dancer, instructor, DJ, and lecturer. 
I want to take the time to address a video that was posted by an international dancer that might have been going around before it was taken down. In this video post, the word or phrase reverse racism was used. The phrase was used to explain how two white dancers that were part of Whitey's Lindy Hoppers were at times intentionally left out of a lot of group photos, article mentions, and video footage from the rest of the black dancers in Whitey's Lindy Hoppers. At least, that's my understanding, having seen the video before it got taken down. Many members of the dance scene have reached out to said dancer to explain, hopefully in a respectful way, why using the phrase reverse racism in the manner that it was used in the video was problematic and a mistake. Now, I say all of this context to get to the point of my post. Mistakes happen, and that's in quotation marks. In his attempt to help educate the dance scene about African-American cultural history and social context, he wound up using the phrase reverse racism without fully understanding how harmful and weaponized that phrase has been used and currently still is being used by a good portion of white American society. I apologize for my neighborhood. Uh, so there's a bunch of honking if you didn't hear it. Uh, by a good portion of white American society towards African, black American people and other American people of color. Which brings me to this and many points I would like to make. Whether you are someone who is from African black American culture or someone from outside of the culture, if you are going to take it upon yourself to try and do your part to help educate and inform the scene about African black American cultural history and social context, make sure you fully understand to the best of your ability the subject matter that you are wishing to share about African black American culture. I think it was great that this international dancer wanted to share his knowledge and what he learned and this is something personally that myself and many other people in the scene around the world have been pushing the scene to start doing and continue doing. But if in your research you come across a word, phrase, a time period, a location, etc. that you want to use in your educational piece that you don't understand it fully, then please reach out to one, a black American in the scene that also has spent time doing research to understand the social situations of what African Americans have to live through socially in America. Two, or reach out to a non-black American. There is no excuse in today's world of technology and instant access to information, documents, and people to not get a better understanding of other cultures' history and the art forms. But if you happen to be someone that has made an unintentional mistake and is being called out on it, first off, nobody's perfect and mistakes are going to happen. And people are going to get justifiably angry, and that's their right. There are steps you can take to help lower the temperature. It won't make the problem go away, but it will go a long way into erasing the problem. Make a public apology directed specifically to the group of people that most likely have been affected by your remarks or actions first. Your remarks or actions didn't emotionally or psychologically affect one member of African, African Black American culture. It affected many members of the culture, whether you know them personally or not. Your actions and words will most likely have emotionally triggered in a negative way things that current and past African Black American culture had and have to deal with on a constant basis whether we, uh, whenever we try to raise issues of social injustices in American society. Reverse racism is a word that is used against Black Americans and other people of color Americans by a large population of white American society to gaslight the issues we are trying to bring awareness and change to. Next, address the current issue to which people are upset about. Acknowledge that you made a mistake in judgment. Acknowledge that you should have reached out to people to get a second, third, or fourth opinion before posting. Acknowledge your own flaws in your research and understanding of the issues. Let the culture that you're directing your apology to and the dance scene as a whole know what your intent was in making the post. What was the overall message or issue you were trying to bring awareness to? It's not about your ego. It's not about litigating your past good deeds. It's not about how nice you are as a person, and it's not about getting people to come to your defense. Own up to the fact that you made a mistake, whether it was understandable or not, and listen to those who are trying to help you understand why your words or actions were ill-advised. Acknowledge how you are going to take this experience and learn from it moving forward. 
to try and do better. To make a more concerted effort to not let this unfortunate but educational experience prevent you from continuing to help inform and educate the scene about blues and jazz music, the dances associated with it, and most importantly, the people to which it comes from. Make it about the culture. It's not you, it's about the culture. Next, make your second to last apology again, directly, uh, directed specifically to the group that was most affected by your words or actions. When you only apologize to one person or to one organization, you are basically saying, I don't care if other members of the culture are emotionally or psychologically hurt by my actions. One person, one organization, one dance scene, or one dance troupe does not speak for all of African black American culture. If you apologize to one person or an organization, then that individual organization or person has the right to accept or decline your apology. It doesn't mean that everyone else from African black American culture has to or will accept your apology. Lastly, apologize to everyone else in the dance scene that also might have been emotionally and psychologically affected by your words or actions, especially Americans who are trying to be genuine allies to black and POC Americans and their ongoing struggles for social and racial justice in this country and around the world. I hope this helps for any who find themselves in a situation where they have made a mistake. It's okay to make mistakes that are that is the only way we grow and learn as human species. Please continue to be safe and healthy. As always, my PM door is open for anyone who wants to discuss and try to get a better understanding of African Black American cultural history and social context. Once again, that is written by Odysseus Baylor. I wanted to do a nomenclature nomenclature um, determination. So I wanted to add some context around maybe some of the words that were chosen. So um, Odysseus in his um, statement frames, like specifically is referring to a group of people um, and they're identified as black or African American. And um, as I was thinking about this, it made me think about um, the term that many people refer to as BIPOC or BIPOC. So oftentimes, um, I've, I've, I've been in many conversations where people are saying, when we say people of color, who do we mean? And so in this last year, what I've seen happen in many conversations is this clarity of specifying black or African-American individuals um, because of um, the different social contexts in which identifying identifying in that way is deeply impactful, right? And so in swing dancing, we know that um, the it, that swing dancing is a black cultural art form. It, it came out of communities um, with people who are who um, are from the African diaspora, people who've descended from Africa or have come from the Caribbean. And that's what we mean when we say black or African-American is people who identify as um, coming from the Caribbean, coming from Africa. Um, and so we consider the term African-American to be the more politically correct term um, oftentimes, but that's not necessarily the case because like in my case, I'm technically not an American. So I'm technically not African-American. Um, but I do identify in that way because of how long I've lived here. So that was just like a simple nomenclature thing if we want to include that. Um, so there's that. And then the other piece um, I thought of in reflecting on what Odysseus said is that he did such a brilliant job. Odysseus did such a brilliant job of outlining how to apologize and so um, when we started this podcast and as we've engaged in many conversations, our goal has been to move forward in an inclusive way, in a way that calls people in and um, keep helps us hold ourselves accountable in a safe way. Um, and I felt like he did that. He demonstrated such grace and um, and offers up this um, 
this mechanism for people to engage in genuine and honest reflection and apology. And a lot of that has to do with owning your um, error, but then not necessarily, like, I feel like sometimes when we own our errors, we might take up space away from people who, the, uh, away from the people who've been hurt. So own your, your, own the thing that you did wrong, make a genuine apology, and then work to, um, to, to do better. When you know better, do better. And I feel like that's essentially what he's saying. He's saying, work to know better, talk to the people who are informed, um, and do your own homework, you know? So I, I really love his, I, I, I love yeah, yeah. these words. And so thank you, Bobby, for reading. Yeah, there's that, uh, yeah, and there's that, um, there's that sentence, acknowledge how you are going to take this experience and learn from it moving forward. Um, you know, that's, that's such a, I, I think, you know, we in the swing scene have had opportunities for quite a few apologies and, you know, a lot of times, you know, there's that gut feeling about whether or not a person's apology, how sincere that apology is or not. Mm. Uh, and you're the like, I'm sorry you were offended apology versus, uh, <laughs> and I, I think that, um, I, I think that sentence right there, the, uh, the sentence Acknowledge how you're going to take this experience and learn from it moving forward is such a crucial one in the sincerity of your apology is the like, not only did I know I messed up, here's what this messing up taught me and here's what I am going to change about my behavior going forward. Uh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And and actually to to tie this into our earlier conversation about you teaching and um your um developmental process as an instructor you asked your co-instructor to give you feedback um and so and you listened to her like she you know so i feel like that that um that's such Well to be fair at the beginning she gave me feedback without me asking about it. And then I realized it was really good feedback. And so, yeah, to be fair. That is, that's a, that is a really good point. But now I ask for feedback. Yes. <laughs> I, I think we could also, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, please, please. Um, but I think we could also um, maybe uh, submit that under like youthful exuberance and maybe... <laughs> Uh, not so like because sometimes when we're younger we say things and we act in a way that's not the most thoughtful so getting giving unsolicited feedback I, I wouldn't that's not something I would necessarily um, encourage a person to do but you you when you did ask for feedback you listened you would just I mean so on so so uh it's not like kate goes around telling every person that interrupts her that <laughs> hey you interrupt me right like she she cared deeply about me our relationship is very important to her and i'm her business partner and right. so like right. those were three really good reasons why she felt she needed to call me out on something that was hurting her that was a detriment not only to her our emotional relationship that I'm her friend and I'm interrupting her. That's not really respectful, but also it's detrimental to her business relationship where like, how can I expect other people to respect her, her words if her own teaching partner isn't respecting her enough to finish the sentence. So, yeah. but yeah, so like, I, I think, so maybe for our listeners, if there's someone who's really important in your life, unsolicited feedback is sometimes the only way you're going to get that. <laughs> get that across. <laughs> yeah. But you know, um, everything you just said ties back into like an earlier episode where you were asking me the conditions under which it was okay for people to do certain things. Right. So you were like, um, how, Oh yeah. Yeah. Right. You're like, 
um, would it be okay if I touched your hair? Would it be okay if I made a comment about this or that? Or like um, it, all of the different questions that you asked me were context specific, right? So this yeah. brings back this understanding of nuance in relationships. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and so, so yeah, like o Odysseus is referring to the relationship that a person who has some level of power, obviously um, indicated by the fact that they can present something for the for the majority of the scene to see. So that that visibility yeah. um, is a reflection of power. So then, their behavior is either beneficial, neutral, or harmful. And this behavior weighted into the harmful territory because of. Um, the dismissive tone associated with some of the terminology used, right? And 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 so 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 we were talking about the relationship between a prominent person and the scene. Whereas, like when we think about our individual relationships, context is key, right? And so yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Integrated rhythm with Jasomo and Bobby. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for listening to Integrated Rhythm. We'd first off like to thank Tom Blair for his fantastic advice and Robots Radio Network for all of their support. We would also like to thank Michelle Stokes and Laurel Ryan for their musical musings. Thank you so much for our yeah. introduction, our outro, and anything, any sound things you hear in the middle that are really cool, that's them. We appreciate you. And special thanks to Jessica Miltenberger for her enduring support, not only of this podcast and the inner workings thereof, but also as my wife. And great gratitude goes out to our friends and family who are the shoulders that we lean on and the ears that we speak to. If you listen to this podcast, you're part of that, and we appreciate your enduring support. <laughs>